Thanks very much. Can you all hear me uh, at the back? Yes. And, and apologies as well about the handout. I had absolutely no idea that so many people were going to come, and I now find that I'm going to have to reprint my handout for, uh, for the, the gig in Aberdeen uh, tomorrow, and indeed for the one in Stornoway later on, which will be very interesting. Um, I've been working on tonight's subject, as you've heard, for quite a few years now. This intriguing character, Martin Martin, Hebridean traveller, Hebridean author and compiler of A Late Voyage to St Kilda, um, perhaps the most detailed ethnography I'd, su I'd suggest of a single community in the early modern era, and also this compendious fund fundamental foundational text, the description of the Western Islands of Scotland of 1703. Um, I've been studying Martin Martin for quite a few years, uh, most recently during a British Academy funded half sabbatical uh, last year. It's a mid-career uh, fellowship, so apparently it's downhill all the way from now. <laughs> My research, however, has been hugely aided um, by, by a number of uh, very important scholars in the field, uh, Charles Weathers in geography, uh, Michael Hunter regarding the highland occult aspects of the scientific revolution, um, Andrew Fleming's very interesting work concerning our early modern St Kilda and the canonical volumes of violent history written by Robert Dodgson, Tom Devine and Alan McInnes. Um, despite my early pretensions to scholarly originality and independence, I have to admit that I find that my interests chime with the times now that early modern antiquarianism and folklorists have found themselves in the historical mainstream. Uh, so I find myself a representative figure in contemporary historiography rather than despite myself. Anyway, the description here is rather challenging to tackle. The book is basically an island by island guide to the Hebridean archipelago um, on the west coast of Scotland um, with very interesting plagiarised accounts of the northern isles of Orkney and Shetland bolted on. Um, here we are. Martin, Martin, and the different roles he plays, depending on what islands he is writing about. Um, and here's the structure here. He begins with the Outer Hebrides, moving from north to south. Then he, uh, the centrepiece, if you like, of his island is, uh, of, his, of his book is his own native island, the Isle of Skye. Then he deals with what we might call the Inner Hebrides, starting in Arran and ending up in the, the small isles going north, uh, missing out, islands such as Lismore and uh, Lung, which aren't on the main shipping lanes, and finally ending up with a bang in uh, St Kilda, uh, re 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 reprising what one might say his first uh, great volume, The Late Voyage. Um, to engage with a sea of profusion of material gathered by Martin for his books requires encountering various historiographic fields as well as historical geography, anthropology, ethnography, choreography and Scottish Gaelic literature. Martin is something of an ethnographic jukebox. He's always come up with something new on every page. Attempting to get grips with this uh, detailed local information requires um, acquaintance of and cooperation with local experts, with local historians, local genealogists in a plethora of different islands. Uh, task made slightly easier by a previous life when I was an actor and we performed shows for communities and schools uh, in almost all the inhabited Hebrides uh, apart from Great Cumbrae. Um, for nearly a decade at the end of the 17th century, Martin himself was relentlessly peripatetic, tirelessly in the move engaging in scholarly networks, creating assemblages of objects and texts, creating knowledge, in effect gradually reimagining the world of the Hebrides for an outside readership, eventually compiling perhaps the key text which framed and informed how later travellers and indeed later locals, later islanders themselves, would perceive the Hebrides and Hebrideans. Um, the epistemological promiscuity of Martin Martin's encyclopedic source as of other contemporary choreographic sources composed in this age of generalists, represents then something of a challenge. Um, contemporary editors tend to focus on letters and the scholarly networks thereby created and maintained, rather than confronting the texts of the work themselves. Um, as part of the Martin Martin project, what I've been trying to do is to very slowly create a digital archive of Martin's work, tagged, indexed, linked, and accompanied by a whole series of capsule essays um, dealing with everything from eagles to shellfish, from alcohol to imperial trades. Again, the pitfall to be skirted here, um, the same as was cast at Martin by his contemporaries and against also the editors of the Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions, is 
mindless antiquarianism, not intelligent antiquarianism, but mindless antiquarianism. It's a very attractive pitfall, it has to be said. Just recording heaps of miscellaneous information for information's sake. Lovely way of spending the time. Um, <laughs> Three obvious comparative sources, however, have rescued me here and allowed me to frame and balance this microhistory with a bit of rigour and a bit of weight. Um, firstly, of course, a huge amount of recent scholarship investigating and elucidating the proto-scientific enterprises and endeavours of the period in national and in global contexts should being published, especially material online, very, very interesting sites from the like of Oxford's E-Enlightenment Project, um, The Cultures of Knowledge, um, early modern letters online and the new epistolarium from Utrecht and Huygens INC. Um, secondly, of course, the major national archives and family monuments in Scotland. Above all, the newly opened Inverera archives of the Dukes of Argyll, which gives us thousands of estate rentals, accounts, letters, official ecclesiastical reports and miscellaneous source material with which we can contrast very often the information in Martin's text. Finally, there's a groundbreaking, um, there's a, a huge amount of groundbreaking archaeological and environmental research into the early modern highlands. So I'll divide this paper into uh, two halves, or the third half at the end here. In the first, I'll try not to give a breakneck biography of Martin Martin himself as broker or intermediary, as cultural entrepreneur, as an outstanding negotiator of networks, as an author, and as somebody who is very lucky, who happened to be in the right place at the right time. In the second half I'll have a look back and try to say something about Martin's biggest break, his voyage to the remote island of St Kilda, why he was there and what he did there. So to begin with, Philip Martin Martin, a life, probably born in the mid-1660s, the third son of Donald Martin, Chamberlain of Trotternish in Skye. I'd like to lay a special stress upon his father's occupation. He was in effect, a state steward of the most fertile district of the lands of his chief, Sir James MacDonald of Slade. Roger Hainworth's great book, Stewards, Lords and People, emphasises the steward's role as occupying that interface between internal regulation of lands and people under his stewardship on the one hand and the outside commercial world on the other. The ideal steward had to be able to handle a wide variety of individuals and classes, to win their trust and to promote prosperity through harmony, to keep order, to collect rent, to supply intelligence to his master, to have an intimate knowledge of the assets and properties of the estate, of potential methods for improving them, and of strategies for marketing the resulting produce to the wider world. Martin's father, Donald, was good at his job. He was able to send all three of his sons to university. The cultural and social amphibiousness of the father, I believe, we see writ large in the son. And I think it's crucial to emphasise that Martin is not simply a one-off. The same capacities which he demonstrates during his career, above all that wonderful capa capability of taking advantages of opportunities in the highlands when offered, negotiating social networks in the region, and much further afield with an eye for the main chance. Well, these are the same factors that determine the success or failure of his, his Highland contemporaries, whether they stay at home and run estates, or else take advantage of the new opportunities of business and or professional careers, and embarking and colonising that burgeoning fiscal military state. Through his mother, Mary, Mary, daughter of Alistair, brother of Don Goromog, the chief's father, Martin was closely related to the chiefly family, Macdonald's of Slate. He's brought up at Martin's farm of Bialo, um, just beside the main seat of the chiefs here at Duntalm Castle, the far northern tip of Skye. Nevertheless, despite these close connections with the Macdonalds, it's clear that the Martin family stood somewhat apart from other lineages on the estate. In a letter to the Welsh traveller and polymath Edward Cloyd, Martin ventures... As for Sir Robert Sibbald's opinion of the Picts to have been Danes, as a matter of which I suspend my opinion, the Highlanders are not of a fair Danish complexion. Neither is it probable the Picts were fair, but generally black as the present inhabitants are. And Martin's own family claimed descent from a um, Danish princess building, supposedly buried here at Stromfjöli. Um The piece might imply in his own mind, at least, that his own kindred were of a different origin 
from their neighbours. He certainly advises Floyd in a later letter, pray, pray do not uh, add Mac to my name since neither myself nor any of my tribe ever use it. This is a blatant untruth given that the Gaelic name is Kwanike Yavarstein. Machi Yavarstein. Even though Martin came from the minor Gaelic gentry, closely related to the local magnate, they were probably connected with um, St. Martin's Church in the district here, Kiev of Arstein. Um, but nevertheless, in his own mind, he stood apart from his compeers. And did this assumed lineage supply Martin with that crucial extra affiliation to give him a leg up or even outside the recognised social hierarchy in the islands to stand slightly askance at his island contemporaries? A clean Danish origin in passing might have proved rather useful later in his career in securing the patronage of Queen Anne's hapless husband, Prince George of Denmark, for the, the description. Um, Martin's precociousness is demonstrated from the fact that he began studying at the University of Edinburgh in his early teens, as governor and companion, firstly of the son of his own chief, his contemporary Donald MacDonald, later known as Donald Hockey, Donald of the War, and then of the heir to the neighbouring MacLeods of Paris, Roderick MacLeod of Ruariog, young Roderick. This evidently allowed Martin to hone his social skills and to make useful social contacts for his future career. It also meant that Martin spent much of his adolescence, his formative years, away from the Hebrides, down in the Lowlands, in Edinburgh. It should be stressed then that Martin does come at the society and the people he writes about from a somewhat off-centre perspective. Let's say a few brief words about historical background here. Martin belonged to a long-established fa uh, family of taxmen, the managerial class in the Scottish Highlands. He must have been aware from his early youth of the unprecedented transformations then going on in the Highland economy and in Highland society. The cattle trade was thriving. More and more Scottish girls were travelling south. They were becoming aware of the outside world and the myriad possibilities offered therein for profit, for pleasure, and for advancement. At home, traditional culture was changing exceptionally quickly, perhaps most obviously in the new styles of dress which were then being, uh, being adopted. There's uh, where Martin's from, right at the very top there of Trotronish. Um, above all, in terms of dress, within a generation, Highland women had discarded the Yarasach, the ancient striped plaid, and began to follow English, or indeed European fashions. So we have the word fasan, fashion, a word much in vogue in Gallic poetry of the period. Men of the gentry, much to the disgust of their tenantry, began to prefer the black cloak of a despised lowlander to the traditional tartan. Although many Gallic songs from the period have lost their airs and they can only be read as bare verses without any music, their hitherto unusual iambic nature, da 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 da, suggests that the tunes were originally composed for English and Scottish language ballads. It's not a Gallic native Gallic rhythm, if you like, um, but these were being these tunes were being taken up to the Highlands and re-employed for Gallic songs and enjoying a contemporary vogue amongst the bards of the Gaeltoch. Um, architectural styles are changing as well. We have smaller, more domestic mansions being built for the clan elite, where the chief and his family could live and entertained walled off from their followers. Some aristocrats even quitted clan lands altogether, uprooting themselves to the lowlands, where they could enjoy a better climate, a more comfortable lifestyle, and a more congenial company while supplying their children with more promising educational opportunities and most crucially of all, a profitable marriage market. At the same time, the outside world was taking an ever closer interest in the Highlands. Just as English tunes were enjoying a vogue in the Highlands, so the Scotch snaps of Gallic tunes, brought back by returning Cromwellian soldiers, had already entertained and delighted metropolitan audiences since the Commonwealth era. So you have Scotch songs, being, re uh, being regularly in, uh, performed as uh, entrants on the London stage. The genre may have little, had little to do with Scotland in reality, but for audiences the point was that the songs were performed in tartan costume. Most importantly, the late 17th century saw the, fas the fashioning in Eng English of that fascinating literary character, the noble savage, and alongside the Laplander and the American Indian, the Scottish Highlander was slotted neatly into this romantic or proto-romantic stereotype. It was not just in the literary world that the Gael was attracting interest. 
The older generation of London virtuosi had long been interested in the Highlands as an occult laboratory, where out of the ordinary, prodigious and preternatural happenings might occur. Above all, they were fascinated by the phenomenon of second sight. The Scottish Highlander was thus far from being an unfamiliar figure in London when Martin arrived there. To achieve notice, his writings had to indulge already existing cultural stereotypes. <coughs> If the figure of the Scottish Highlander was attracting interest for his cultural quirks, his homeland, the Highlands, the Gaeltacht, was increasingly an object of concern to politicians, clergy and economic projectors. For much of the second half of the 17th century, the Highlands had been inadequately governed, mired in strife and disorder, occasionally, in the West at any rate, collapsing into outright civil war and rebellion. The region was the one area of mainland Britain which adamantly refused to accept the accession of William of Orange. Despite reprisals and massacres, Gallic Jacobites resisted the forces of government for some three years, eventually fighting the British army to a standstill. As a war zone, the region remained a priority for Scottish government. During the 1690s, when Martin was making his expeditions through the Hebrides, charting and pacifying the region, imposing authority there, were matters of urgency for state and newly established Presbyterian Church alike. Martin could not have accomplished his programme without financial support and encouragement from the new Scottish political and ecclesiastical establishments. Indeed, on one level, his work is part of a wider and ultimately unsuccessful project of discovering and disciplining the Highlands by the late 17th century authorities in Scotland. So there's a demand for regional brokers, for facilitators, to interpret this new economic frontier, to speed up the imposition of central authority and to help unlock new opportunities. Given the expertise which he, which he had acquired from his family background and from his contacts, not to mention his own personal ambition, Martin saw himself as eminently qualified to perform such a role and to profit both financially and socially therefrom. Just as a taxman was the crucial link between chief and tenantry, so Martin wished to fulfil a similar position between the Highlands and the metropolis as commentator, guide, spokesman, developer and entrepreneur. Martin's life changed with the death of the man he described as the kindest friend I had on earth on the 24th of June, 1695. This was his erstwhile university companion, Roderick MacLeod, who had succeeded his father as chief of the clan, the MacLeods of Dunvegan, and had employed Martin as a writer and manager. According to MacLeod's verbal instructions, he was left £50 and a suit of clothes. Martin appears to have been all, all, always fascinated by clothes, incidentally. And immediately afterwards, he was dispatched across the North Sea to the Low Countries by the clan lawyer, who is now administrator of clan affairs, doubtless in family business with members of the clan gentry who were then serving the British Army in Flanders. In mid-August, Martin crossed over to London, the metropolis of the moment, a city of riches conscious of its rising status, a cultural magnet drawing to it an astonishing number of artists and musicians and potential natural historians. Martin's letters from London brim over with new information, gossip and indeed news. His first weeks in London were evidently an extraordinary experience for him, opening out new vistas, new possibilities. One of the greatest opportunities suggested to him was to do with the virtuosi of the Royal Society, the main British scientific society and clearing house of knowledge. During his stay in the metropolis, Martin would have met members of the Highland gentry, those in business, and the small but increasing community, mainly merchants, who are now living in London. Among the greatest magnates there was George Mackenzie of Tarbot, politician, Gaelic speaker, antiquarian, natural historian, fellow of the Royal Society with a long-standing interest in second sight. Tarbot appears to have introduced Martin to Sir Hans Sloane, Dr Hans Sloane at the time I should say, editor of the Royal Society's Philosophical Transactions and orchestrator of a widely dispersed network of correspondence throughout the world. Through his, a very useful man, as you can see from the handout. Um, through his contacts, Martin conceived a new ambition. The writer of the preface of a late voice to St Kilda describes how Martin had the honour of conversing with some of the Royal Society, who raised his natural curiosity to survey the Isles of Scotland more exactly than any other. This plan embraced not only compiling observations, 
but also the potentially lucrative um, undertaking of collecting rare and beautiful natural objects for the curiosity cabinets of the English natural historians. Martin left London at the beginning of September 1695 and returned to Skye. In March 1696, he writes from the McLeod Castle of Dunvegan to his friend, the lawyer John Mackenzie of Dalvine, Dalvin, sorry, Dalvin, saying that although he has planned a trip to the Western Isles, he has been unable to accompany, accomplish anything because of the badness of the season and the accident befallen my leg. The bad weather bedeviling the north of Scotland at that time is absolutely crucial to Martin's career. Um, we should remember that Martin had seen the Outer Hebrides since, since childhood from his home in Bialoch, a wonderful view uh, of the, the Hebrides from Uist right the way up to Lewis, but he may never have actually crossed the mensch himself. But eventually he did sail out to the islands, travelling for probably a couple of months. He was greatly disappointed with what he found there. Religion was at a low ebb, French privateers were ravaging the coast, and as he writes, the course of my travels has not much enriched the curiosity of the virtuosi. The islands did not live up to his expectations. The problem seems to lie with how Martin conceived his mission. It's clear from the papers, several observables in the northwest islands of Scotland that he sent to the Royal Society, along with a collection of shells, that he was in search of prodigious or preternatural facts, facts which seem to contradict the laws of nature, generally concerning the influence of the moon or the behaviour of seabirds. Martin had yet to learn how to be a natural historian or a choreographer, to record what he saw systematically. The observables are not of, often, uh, only often incredible, but often rather risible, as you can see with number 11 there, the boy in the out of sky who, quote, has a faculty of erecting his ears at his pleasure. And Martin himself was clearly uneasy about venturing his credibility, writing to his correspondent in London, pray be careful not to deliver any observation that may deserve a censure. Nevertheless, Martin's information was read out to the Royal Society on the 14th of October 1696, and then subsequently published in the Philosophical Transactions. It's apparent um, from the, the, the Royal Society um, uh, minutes that Martin's observations were somewhat too curious for some fellows of the society. Some of them appeared not well grounded, it's written in the journal book. Nevertheless, quote, he was ordered the thanks of the society and they were willing any charges he should be at on their account should be defrayed. Martin had made it into print and he had received financial encouragement for his endeavours. Um, Earlier in summer 1696, Martin had received another financial boost from the will of one of the key members of the MacDonald gentry, Major Hugh MacDonald, probably the compiler of the history of the, the manuscript history of the MacDonalds. Um, he had been killed in service in the Low Countries. Uh, MacDonald's will let us see that Martin had begun to study for a degree in divinity, probably at Edinburgh. Um, Martin must already have made the acquaintance of Sir Robert Sibyl, the Royal Geographer in Scotland, the foremost natural historian in the country. In January 1697, Sibyl writes to the natural historian and conchologist Martin Lister in Oxford, and my friend Master Martin is now in the Isle of Skye and is to visit some of the adjacent isles. He has promised an account of what he findeth curious there relating to natural history. With support from natural historians in Scotland and in England then, Martin had undertaken a second trip around the Hebrides. It's likely that again that he travelled around the Outer Isles, or at least some of them, before embarking from the island of Ensey on the 29th of May 1697 for the island of <laughs> St Kilda in the company of the Minister of Paris, John Campbell. Um, this is Martin's lucky break and I'll deal with it in the second half of the paper. His journey resulted in a book, A Late Voice to St Kilda, published in April 1698. And uh, thanks to the early modern letters online, we can read this very interesting hint at a contemporary um, reception of the volume in a letter by the physician John Hutton uh, to the naturalist Martin Litter, uh, Lister. Um, he says, The honest plain author has published it. It is no suitable return for the several learned books you have presented me with nor do I send it as such, but because it is new, and like it by those of the society that has any account of it. This is the first copy I have seen from the press. Its method and diction may not please, but valiat quantum valerie posit, it is a matter of fact, and the man's own. 
Um, matter of fact and its own, it would be a wonderful subtitle for Martin's biography perhaps. Um, we don't know how much of Martin is in the late history, how much that comes from Martin himself or how much that comes from the editors, but it's clear that nobody wants to adorn or embellish Martin's style. It's not learned, it's not rhetorically finished, it's informal, it's rough hewn, it's miscellaneous, it's plain, it's honest. Um, this raw, indigested, vivid style is an extreme example of that intention, according to Henry Oldenburg, the Secretary of the Royal Society, of seeking to register matters of fact with faithfulness, but without artifice, without elaborateness. The Society's Baconian program calling for a return to the primitive purity when men delivered so many things almost in an equal number of words. And, um, John Hutton um, rounds off his, his letter with the apologetic conclusion, Mr. Martin is a Highlander born in the Isle of Skye, but off his English could not be expected to be the best. <laughs> um, the style may be rough hewn, but the structure is rather more sophisticated, um, whether by the editor or by Martin himself. Um, to give an example, um, Charles Withers draws attention to the beginning of the book with the very precise contextual details of when and where Martin set out as a genetic int introduction, as it were, to a scientific tract. Martin's very specific about when and where he set out from. Um, what Charlie neglects to note, however, is what happens afterwards, how that trust in the precision is undermined over the next few pages, as Martin relates the terrifying voyage he and the crew undergo as they battle for three days against a terrific storm, how it threw the boat dangerously off course, and how the islanders' trust in observing the flight of local seabirds provided just as efficacious as any scientific in, in, uh, instrument. Um, Martin May commence his account with this particular observation, only to destabilise this on the very next page of his volume. The message is that we have battled our way out with the author to a far distant place where normal rules and conventions don't necessarily hold. Um, another suggestion of Martin's sophistication um, in, in, the, in the letter it's where the author has promised some other accounts of other islands of the manners ancient and modern of these people their traditional observations in medicine of the second sight etc if he have encouragement in other words if he gets funding um, this reveals that the format of what would eventually become the description of 1703 was already in Martin's mind five years before its publication and for the rest of the decade Martin's investigations would depend upon patronage and financial encouragement from any source he could get. Um, this is uh, a very precise beginning of the late voyage and then afterwards things get destabilised very, very quickly. Indeed throughout the description there are glancing references to the unseasonable weather of the late 1690s and its effects. To quote Martin, the great changes of the seasons, which of late years has become more piercing and cold, by which the growth of the corn, both in the spring and summer seasons, are retarded. This is the seven ill years um, of uh, King William, the nadir of the Little Ice Age, hitting particularly heavily the northern part of Scotland, a region of subsistence agriculture where some coastal districts were already suffering um, degraded environment. And the years following 1695 were marked by cold wet weather, the worst of living memory, multiple harvest failures, spiraling grain prices, mortality among flocks, and a horrendous death toll among humans, maybe higher than 20% in some highland parishes, mainly caused by epidemics, caused by you know, nutrition levels, uh, detailed in, in Karen Cullen's wonderful book uh, on uh, King William's seven ill years. Um, Many parishes in the region didn't have Presbyterian ministers, they didn't have Kirk sessions, therefore local poor laws didn't function. Um, nationally, the time of dearth and famine um, exacerbated an already challenging economic situation caused by high wartime uh, taxation and the disruption by French privateers of the coastal shipping trade would seem to be pushed to the limits by the catastrophe of the Darien colonization scheme. Uh, Martin's description delineates a world, a world where, for example, in Lewis, the late years of scarcity brought them very low, and many of the poor people have died by famine, where new diseases have been brought in by strangers, where entire communities were being forced to live in famine food such as shellfish, and where previous customs of hospitality shown to strangers have been totally revoked. 
Um, the need to find new sources of protein for a starving population had encouraged Scottish virtuosi and the Scottish Government to look to the seas, to develop fisheries, to develop whaling. One fundamental requirement was accurate charts of the dangerous coasts of the west of Scotland. Um, in 1698, during one of the worst summers in record, Martin occupied a berth in John Adair's disastrous official surveying expedition, which eventually ended in shipwreck and mutual recriminations. Um, Adair had no choice but to accept his official undertaking, um, but three days before he set off for the Hebrides, he prudently registered his will. Um, the original charts which Adair compiled with beautiful, beautiful objects had been recently relocated in Taunton. The disappearance for nearly three centuries remind us that we should not only study the creation of natural knowledge during the period, but also its maintenance and indeed its destruction. These maps allow us to trace the ill-starred voyage as it wandered backwards and forwards across the Minch. The disaster which overtook this surveying expedition and the relentless squabbles which arose between Adair and Martin in the aftermath were inevitable. Um, during the two years following his involvement in Adair's voyage, Martin was able to continue to undertake expeditions through the islands. With his influential contacts in Edinburgh and in London, he was able to secure payment of money owed by the authorities for his part in Adair's expedition, as well as to receive further sponsorship from Sir Hans Sloan in London and Sir Robert Sibbott in Edinburgh. At the same time, Martin was now employed as an agent for its erstwhile pupil, Sir Donald MacDonald of Slate. This position must have allowed him to travel widely throughout the islands to and from the lowlands and clan business. By 1700, Martin had composed a report on the Island of Lewis, or sorry, was composing a report, I should say, on the Island of Lewis, and he was requesting funds in order to put together similar, um, similar, um, similar descriptions. Um, but once more, he had a much more ambitious, um, ambitious design in mind. Um, in addition to his freelance and his estate work, the many manuscripts in his hand in the Sibbald collection suggest that Martin was direct, directly employed by Sibbald, by the geographer royal, in compiling a, a, a catalogue of the islands of Scotland for himself, probably with a view towards eventual publication or incorporation into the geographer's project for a great Scottish atlas. So Martin had access to many previous accounts of the Western Islands of Scotland, what they were. What they were. Um, however, much to Sibbald's disapproval, Martin evidently decided to take over the project himself. And thus, in the autumn of 1701, he travelled south to uh, London. Um, I'll miss out the bits where, where he's, uh, he's missed out. He, he loses, Martin loses uh, Edward Cluyd's uh, Ichnographia, the, the copy sent to, uh, um, to uh, Sibbald, much to Sibbald's disgust uh, as well, <laughs> Very, the great fallout between the two clearly. In London, um, Martin spent the next two years composing what was to become his most famous work, the description of the Western Isles of Scotland. Um, it's clear that possibly because of the ramifications of the Darien crisis, which had effectively bankrupted the country, um, the publication of this extraordinary book was not at all painless. The government had authorised the payment of £60 to Martin out of the Exchequer in early 1703 to enable the printing of the description, but funds were not forthcoming. Um, oh, let's move this back, sorry to hear. Um, pursued by his creditors during and after publication, Martin had no alternative but to flee Scotland for sky, to quote, where no books nor converse are to be looked for. Um, that's according to Martin himself. He sat four years out in Skye, rather glumly, uh, and then on the eve of the Union of Parliaments in 1707, the exchequer money owed to Martin was eventually paid. And it looks that immediately Martin got this news. He left his employment and set out for the metropolis, firing off a quick contribution to the Royal Society's transactions on his way south by way of a calling card. Now that Scotland was being absorbed in a, a London-dominated United Kingdom, there would surely be fresh opportunities for experts, such as himself, to advise on Scottish policy in the South. However, if Martin expected the authorities to take an interest, 
in the ambitious economic development projects he had sketched out at the end of his description, which is really the main point for the description, he was sorely disappointed. Although he continued to take an interest in the financial opportunities of his homeland, Martin never secured the official patronage he desired. He would work freelance for his bread for the next few years, resuming his activities as tutor on the continent, and finally graduating in 1710 as a doctor at Leiden. And it was on the edges of the London metropolis at Knightsbridge that Martin spent the apparently rather uneventful final few years of his short life. There was a second edition of the description in 1716, doubtless launched with an eye to cashing in and renewed interest in the Highlands in the aftermath of the Jacobite Rising the previous year. It was a sort of tie-in to the Jacobite Rising. After a trip to Holland in summer 1718, Martin fell seriously ill and he died at Knightsbridge of consumption on the 11th of October 1718 and was buried at St Martin's in the fields. Uh, very appropriately. Um, St Kilda. Why did Martin visit the remote, isolated island of St Kilda, part of the territories of the MacLeods of Dunbegin, in 1697? Here's Martin himself on the, on the trip. Um, the Laird of MacLeod heartily recommending the care of the inhabitants of St Kilda to Mr John Campbell, Minister of Harris, who accordingly, accordingly went to St Kilda, who accordingly went to St Kilda, Campbell went to St Kilda. As we have seen, it's possible that at the time Martin was working as a student of, Martin was studying um, divinity at Edinburgh, and it does look as if he had gone as Martin's, as the minister's assistant, as the assistant of Mr John Campbell. <coughs> Their mission was to help impose religious orthodoxy on the St Kildans, who had fallen under the influence of a charismatic leader Martin describes as Roderick the imposter. Um, Roderick, um, let's go, there we go. Roderick, a Ruari, claimed to have obtained the foundation of his religion or sect or cult from John the Baptist, whom he met in the 18th year of his age while going to fish on a Sunday. John the Baptist, clad in lowland dress, a cloak and a hat, told him, quote, he had immediately come from heaven with good tidings to the inhabitants of that place, who had been for a long time kept in ignorance and error. He had commissioned to instruct Roderick in the laws of heaven for the edification of his neighbours. Roderick was a very able man. He was to, uh, Martin describes him as a comely, well-proportioned fellow, red-haired and exceeding all the inhabitants of St Kilda in strength, climbing, etc. It wasn't long before Roderick had recruited most, if not all, of the islanders to his religion. In so doing, he reinvented himself into almost a textbook example of a charismatic sect or cult leader, expecting total commitment from his congregation. Um, we might describe Roderick nowadays as suffering from hallucinations and psychotic episodes. Martin considered it, however, the more probable that he was haunted by a familiar spirit, conjecture which brings home forcibly to us the vast difference between modern and early modern casts of mind. Um, Roderick wasn't, a, he, he wasn't just a one-off. He hadn't just suddenly appeared in the scene when Martin arrived in St Kilda. He had held sway over the Anders for at least eight years. Um, possibly even longer. He was certainly preaching in the year an earthquake hit the island, maybe a landslip and a group of wrecked French and Spanish sailors sought shelter in there, and this, these occasions are dated to 1686. Some of the details Martin gives of Roderick's new religion are remarkably similar to a sort of bastard Roman Catholicism. The imposter taught his flock prayers and rhapsodical forms, often blended with the name of God or blessed, and our blessed Saviour, the Immaculate Virgin. He used the Irish word versichen, that is, verses, which is not known in St Kilda, nor in the North West Isles, except to such as can read the Irish tongue. He taught the women a devout hymn, which he called the Virgin Mary, so as he went from her. He persuaded the people that some of their deceased neighbours were nominated saints in heaven, and advocates for them here who survived. He told everyone had his respective advocate. The anniversary of every saint was to be commemorated by every person under whose tutelage they were reputed to be. Several penances were introduced. Now, all these items surely was something to missionary Catholicism of the time. The 1680s, mid-1680s, were an era when Catholic missionaries were active in Eurist, islands regularly visited by St Kildans. Um, the lack of outside religious control is crucial here. 
We might wonder just how often the Minister of Harris visited his most outlying congregation in St Kilda. The more so that when he did visit in 1697, he consecrated 15 marriages out of an apparent number of 27 families. Martin had foreseen similar troubles about travelling round the islands himself in 1696. Possibly after hearing about the St Kildans, he explicitly states his doubt in Campbell himself. I am uncertain as to the person of Harris. This puts a fair opportunity for the popish priests who will not lose time at such a juncture. A short space might dispose the common people for popery or atheism. The contempt of baptism and sponsors or gossips, as they call them here, inclines sorry, the contempt of baptism and sponsors or gossips, as they call them here, inclines them more to popery, for they will have their children christened, though by a layman. The dangers Martin had foreseen in 1696 were brought home to him the following year in St Kilda. People needed religious assurance, especially regarding the baptism of newly born children at a time of high infant mortality. If there were no official supply, they would have to create their own. And this is all the more true in St Kilda, where the peculiar nature of the society and its extraordinary isolation led it down a very singular path. So a small number of people, 180 when Martin visited, isolated from the outside world for seven or eight months a year. Um, between June and September, however, the steward of St Kilda, who lived um, for the rest of the year over in Pape, um, in the Sound of Harris, would journey over to St Kilda, taking with him 40, 50 or 60 persons, and among them, to quote perhaps the most meagre in the parish, are carried thither to be recruited with good cheer. The steward and his retinue would therefore spend the summer basically living off the St Kildans. Oh, it's there as well. Um, having right to all the milk produced in the island, and they were able to lift onerous rents. To quote Alexander Fleming, um, the arrival of the chief's representatives would have been a mixed blessing in which the delivery of vital supplies and making a renewal of contact with outsiders and the sense of inclusion within wider social networks were probably often outweighed by the essentially predatory nature of the visit. Islanders certainly had a vested interest in concealing their wealth uh, from the steward and his men. Um, St Kilda was a very stressful environment to live in. The men regularly took high risks, climbing rocks to catch the seabirds that were their principal source of food. There was no doctor, healer or midwife in the community. The need to ensure good neighbourhood may have been a factor in the very early age of marriage in the island, perhaps even as young as ten. The importance of acting together as a group towards outsiders was essential. There's scarce any circumventing them in traffic and bartering. The voice of one is the voice of all the rest, they, be, they being all of a piece, their common interests uniting them firmly, firmly together. Among themselves, equality, equality of opportunity and equality of risk was strictly enforced and regulated by the use of lots among families to share climbing ropes, rocks for catching fowl or fish and the island kiln, as well as to participate in fowling trips. Land was strictly reallocated every three years by the moor or the ground officer, and this is despite the evident and probably growing inequality of income among the islanders, so rich and poor in the community. This dynamic was taking, taking place across the highlands at the time, leading to simplify greatly, to increase diversification of the tenantry into large single tenants and smaller subtenants. The use of the lot and the enforcement of other community regulations would help to prevent internal social tensions getting out of hand. To quote Martin again, there's not a parcel of men in the world more scrupulously nice and punctilious in maintaining their liberties and properties than these are, being most religiously fond of their ancient laws and statutes. Um, the main resource used to diffuse immediate potential sources of trouble was the islanders' brass crucifix on the church altar. Quoting Martin, when any case happens which does not fall under the decision of lots, and it is capable of being decided only by oath of the parties, then the crucifix must determine the matter. And if it should be a case of the highest importance, any of them is at liberty to refer to his neighbour's oath without any suspicion of perjury, provided the ceremony of touching the crucifix with the right hand be observed. And this is always publicly Performed. The crucifix is a way of ensuring endogenous social control. Obviously a tiny isolated community such as in Kilda was a possible breeding ground for, in Fleming's words, words, areas of potential natural tension 
of fear and disharmony. In Martin's words, the crucifix and the lots are powerful engines to keep them in order. It is an odd case that falleth not under the determination of these. Indeed, Campbell and Martin used the crucifix themselves as something of a truth serum, as it were, when questioning the locals after their arrival. Martin's opportunity to interrogate islanders using the crucifix may go a long way to explain the depth of his understanding of St. Kildan society. Roderick the Impostor's belief system matches up really point by point with present day introversionist sects. Um, against the remote established religion, a charismatic leader claiming to be, to be able to mediate with God imposes his authority upon a marginal group suffering a disturbance of normal social relations. Previous forms of religion are altered to comply with the new, but not too far. The leader expects total commitment, hence we see Roderick enforcing fasts, demanding that Islanders sacrifice any animals eating the sacred bush. Um, the sects see themselves as an elect, hence the St. Kildans make saints of their departed neighbours, and we can assume that the possibility was open um, to the impostors' followers to become posthumous saints themselves. Roderick teachings were kept secret from outsiders, and they put the St. Kildans at the centre of their world. Crucially, the islanders said they accepted Roderick's teachings to quote, because he did not change their laws of neighbourhood. Um, Roderick's native wit and flair to say nothing of his sway over the people comes through clearly in his being able to patch up a quarrel with the ground officer, the steward's representative in the island, who discovered him trying to seduce his wife. The imposter subsequently became the officer's son's godfather. Uh, you understand this is a highland custom of employing godparent relationships to patch up quarrels. Roderick was even able to bear the defection of his cousin Maldoni, who refused to kill his three lambs which had grazed upon the sacred bush. Finally, however, he was discovered by the MacLeod authorities. The turning point was when one of the imposter's sermons, always held after dark, was overheard by a boy a young boy from Harris, John, whose father was spending the winter in St Kilda repairing the Islanders' boat. It may be that in these two stories Martin is telling us a parable too. He's showing us through, um, that through enlightened self-interest, commercial self-interest, uh, Maldoni, and through increased contact with outsiders, the Harrisman, Hebrideans, for whom St Kilda's are the paradigm, are able to discard superstitious beliefs and come to participate in the wider outside world. Martin tells us to quote all which the boy's father communicated to the steward upon his arrival who being highly concerned at the relation given, given him carried Roderick along with him to the Isle of Skye before the late MacLeod who being informed of this fellow's impostures did forbid him from that time forward to preach any more on pain of death. Martin describes the chief in his book as the late MacLeod so he must mean his erstwhile friend Roderick who died as we saw in June 1695. So Roderick the Impostor must have been carried off to Skye in 1694 at the latest and then sent back to St Kilda. At the very least then we have a three year gap between the authorities initial discovery of Roderick the Impostor and their sending the Minister of Harris over to the island to take action in 1697. Why? Well the answer would seem to be bad weather. The deteriorating climate in the Outer Hebrides had led to storms resulting in catastrophic sand blows across the fertile, low-lying western coasts where most islanders lived. Um, Pabbe, in the Sound of Harris, where the steward of St Kilda lived for most of the year, was especially hard hit, and you can see the sand blows there on the island. What was once a very fertile island is becoming less and less so. A terrific storm or hurricane hit the island in 1697, literally scouring out one of the three townships in the island and inundating some 300 acres of agricultural ground under sand. And the clan rentals of the period support the notion that these years were particularly traumatic. There's a stopgap brief rental from 1697 and then it's followed by a major reassessment of the state dues the following year. And something was clearly going badly wrong with the state finances and in particular with the Isle of Pabbi, the erstwhile granary of the clan territories. Under pressure to collect his rents and support his tenantry, um, the steward was under pressure and St Kilda offered him a way out of his dilemma. Um, 
St Kildans didn't suffer to the same extent as other islands during the tough months of spring. They had plenty of eggs and dried fowl stored, there were seals to kill. The guillemots returned to the islands from February onwards. The island, of course, had not been affected by sand blows. The steward thus intended to extract or extort as much as he could from the islanders. The more so because there was, it seems, no fixed strength from the island to MacLeod in Dunvega. It must have been set informally at the steward's own discretion. In fact, the huge rent the stewards paid each year, 100 marks out of the 175 paid by the, the Balmachina tenants in, in, in Pabe in 1680, the 204 they paid in 1703, was surely predicated upon the rent he lifted from the islanders. And now Martin tells us that there are about 180 islanders in St Kilda. He goes on to say that we strangers and the inhabitants of St Kilda made up the number of about 250 all told. And the implication here is that there was an unprecedented number of 70 men, women and children from Pabe and from um, Reverend John Campbell's own tack of the Andavesi um, living off the islanders in the summer of 1697. In addition, the steward made strenuous efforts to levy more barley as rent from each family. He claimed that the end of the traditional ye amor, a measuring trough, had worn away, pretending to, to quote Martin, to a received custom of adding the hand of him that measures the corn to the amor side, holding some of the barley above the due measure, which the inhabitants complain of as unreasonable. The steward offered to refer the decision to the minister, but of course the youngers were having none of this. Um, only an embassy to MacLeod, the chief, would do. It's worth noting that they didn't trust the apparently recently appointed ground officer either. His name, Martin tells us, was Dolmaki Yuchalom. And it's interesting that the rentals tell us that one of the tenants in Balamianok, that was the overwhelmed township, the township which was overrun by the Sandblow in Pabe, was called Dol Maki Yuchalom Glass, maybe the same person. It's probable then that the Reverend John Campbell and Martin Martin accompanied the steward in an attempt to subdue the St Kildans to master them psychologically at a very sensitive time. Just as Stuart was endeavouring to assimilate the islanders more firmly into the clan network economically, so the minister and his assistant were trying to draw them into the ecclesiastical network by enforcing religious conformity. Maybe it's no coincidence that these two attempts were made in the same year. Process of centralising control by both church and the state authorities during the early modern period is widespread, but peculiar circumstances mean that it's especially marked in the case of St Kilda. The church's assertion of power was symbolically accomplished when the minister and the congregation jointly prayed for repentance and pardon to this poor wretch, which when ended, we carried him and all the inhabitants of the bush pretended to be sacred, he himself leading the van, commanded to raise to the ground a part of that wall which he had ordered to be built around the said bush which he and the inhabitants did in the space of an hour who made them scatter the stones up and down the field lest their posterity might see such a monument of folly and ignorance. Roderick the impostor was banished from the island and put to trial in Sky. Um, the islanders, though apparently perfectly willing to get rid of Roderick, they were not so keen on accepting the stewards reassessment of the rent. Whatever agreement was hammered out with MacLeod, further eruptions arose the following year when the Islanders actually employed force to resist an attempt by the steward's brother to appropriate one sheep from each of the families. Additional attempts must have been made to squeeze more rent out of St Kilda. The Chamberlain of Harris's accounts reveal that a delegation of Islanders met with MacLeod in Tarbert in 1705. The following year, for the first time ever, the rent of St Kilda was set in the MacLeod rental at 100 marks worth of barley. Only Martin himself seems to have profited very much from the episode. The success and reputation he gained from his book about St Kilda allowed him to undertake two further journeys around the Hebrides. As a note, um, Martin tells us in his first manuscript account of St Kilda in Sybil's papers that the islanders called his favourite well after him in his honour. Now there's no top of Arshay on the island. But there is a well called Tobrachlerich, um, the well of the clerk or the well of the churchman, um, which is not mentioned in Martin's account. And it may well be that this well, um, Tobrachlerich, the well of the churchman, is Martin's well. If so, it was primarily as a churchman that the islanders regarded Martin Martin. Um, at its simplest level, 
The St Kilda episode provides an interesting example of the challenges involved in the extension of estate and ecclesiastical power during the early modern era, time of extreme economic and environmental stress. Um, in the Highlands, distant from the seat of government, we'd be much more used to negotiating what we might call overlapping jurisdictions of different institutions, whether the church, the state, or the clan. Um, in the case of Martin, Martin, the episode raises intriguing questions concerning the creation and exercise of, exercising of knowledge ob obtained in um, remote communities. Um, I'll finish up with some random points. Um, firstly, there are problems of plenty with just how trustworthy is the information retailed in Martin's account. Martin Martin tends to be written about the Hebridean native, somebody whose knowledge is therefore inherently more trustworthy than the casual visitor. Knowledge of the language, the culture and local contacts are undoubtedly a benefit, but comparing Martin's um, account to contemporary um, documentary sources um, suggests the former's fallibility. I mean, parts of Sky, Martin was a native, but we can see that other parts of Sky he didn't know so well. Look at the, all the archaeological sites which he's looking at. They're very much concentrated in his own native area of Trotternish, not scattered throughout the sky by any means, even though that's his native island. Um, even more so, even more interesting, um, people you trust to tell you stories about the second site. Again, there are people that Martin knows well in Trotternish, and very few out with his own district. Martin was a casual visitor to many of the islands he documents, and as we can see, even in his native sky, his network of trusted informants is notably confined to the northern part of the island where he was brought up and worked. Um, for instance, while I was over in Tyree earlier on, uh, sorry, um, last year in the summer, and uh, problems arise where the convenient proximity of Tyree's twin island call allows Martin to recount several contrasting facts about the inhabitants. For instance, call people always feed on oats, while Tyree people live in barley. Um, they're, they're clearly untrue. They've clearly been told to him by, uh, by locals, and he's written it down. Um, perhaps a more fundamental conceptual problem with the book is its dividing off of Hebridean islands from adjacent mainland territories. Um, this includes the fact that island clans historically needed um, make the, their island territories to be complemented. It's not a very clear, um, clear slide, this is failure of a slide, I'm afraid, that one there. Um, but they, they needed their island territory to be complemented by a mainland wing, particular, particularly as a source of timber to maintain the ships, allowing transport to and from these islands in the first place. Things get more complicated when we look more closely at mainland topography. Many peninsulas in the mainland remain effectively islands, only accessible by ferry, right up until the mid-20th century. Until recently, a journey through any part of the glacier-scoured, heavily fjord-indented west coast mainland would be faced with a variety of sea loch or freshwater lock crossings, as well as the high road. Um, for instance, we have uh, uh, no, uh, records of expensive manuscript books were expected to travel around um, sea locks rather than being carried over them. Everybody else, however, just went over in the ferries. Reading against Martin, we should question that clear-cut division between Ireland on the one hand and mainland islands on the other. Um, for me, Martin is at its strongest in directing our attention towards social institutions, norms, and practices that are transparent in other sources. His account lets us see just how prominent, for example, um, Michaelmas celebrations were across the archipelago. Um, a harvest celebration week of horse racing, drinking, dancing, and fighting at the end of September. Within a century, um, this disappears as a result of the, pro the pressures of the increasing commercialization of gentry withdrawal from popular pastimes, and maybe also because that calendar shift in 1752 effectively shunted Michaelmas back into the middle of the busiest time of the year, the harvest period. <coughs> Again, stray examples to the prevalence of sanctuaries, well, and this uh, Michaelmas uh, focus too much on, on uh, if we focus too much on uh, on uh, church-related festivities, only in the Hebrides, we 
tend to look upon them as being too Celtic, and I don't believe that they are Celtic. I think it's mainstream West European. It's just that the, the mainland of, uh, well, the lowlands and mainland highlands, they, they forget these uh, church sanctioned communal activities after the, Re after the Reformation, very few traces of them. But it's much more, it's not Celtic, it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, mainstream Western European. Um, sanctuaries, straight reference to the prevalence of sanctuaries in the past draw attention to the, the existence, for example, of this major sanctuary complex in the north of Lewis. And this allows us to answer perhaps the conundrum as to why the major legal kindred in the Isles, apparently, in the late medieval era, lived up there in the north of Lewis. They clearly made a lucrative livelihood from acting as brokers between the pursued and the pursuers uh, in uh, this, uh, what we call two halves over uh, on the north, in the north of the district of Ness there. Uh, where the, um, the Morrison kindred, uh, the Breves, uh, had their tack. A final example um, is how Martin draws their attention to the prominence of brewing, for instance, in the Isle of Tyree, focusing our thoughts upon beer drinking as a practice in the Hebrides, um, perhaps suggesting heretical thoughts that recreational whiskey drinking, as opposed to medicinal whiskey drinking in the North, may actually be quite a recent innovation. Whiskey's popularity spreading in the, recent, in the 17th century at the same time as other spirits in other parts of Europe gained pro popularity, gin, brandy and vodka. And before then, Highlanders may well have drunk beer, just like the rest of the population in these islands. Um, so Martin's work had to be set in a wider intellectual context of the ongoing discovery or even discoveries of the Scottish Highlands. Such a study requires a close um, close examination of the various methodologies, discursive practices, institutional allegiances, social relations, target audiences, and indeed eventual successes or failures of the various types of projects concerned in this process. Martin was involved in all of them. The best known category of Highland projects at the time is the intellectual one, taking in works by polymathic virtuosi such as Robert Sibbald or Edward Floyd, for whom Martin was a somewhat unsatisfactory correspondent. We could also uh, include the inquiries into the occult laboratory undertaken in the late 17th century by men such as the Reverend Robert Kirk, writer of the Secret Commonwealth of Elves and Fairies. Others, including some of um, Martin's major patrons, are fascinated by the second sight. Yet with the triumph of Cartesian and Newtonian natural philosophy, the mystic worldview in forming such works was now becoming unfashionable. To Martin's later contemporaries, his younger contemporaries, on the other side of this epistemic fracture, his work already appeared dated superstitious and credulous, even when it was published. Questions of credibility loom large in Martin's career and Martin's afterlife. To touch upon questions of expertise that loom so large in science and technology studies at present that rough hewn style and native status gets him noticed, but at best it can only ever procure for him key informant status, perhaps that of a cultural broker. A series of observations alone could not allow the crucial claims to expertise which could enable Martin to take the official, to secure the official posts which he was clearly aiming at. Um, the description of the Western Arts, we could say, is in effect an extended job application to the government, um, especially regarding developing West Coast fisheries. Martin's contemporaries views of him as credulous rather than admirably open-minded were reinforced by his poshaw for unsuitable subject matter. Second sighted animals and barbaric bird calls, for instance. Does Martin's case draw attention to the fragility of all knowledge claims, above all knowledge claims concerning esoteric subjects, to ridicule and misunderstanding? At any rate, Martin is not used as a source at all in the early 18th century, when information about the Highlands was gathered from official reports in the mid 1720s and in the aftermath of the 1745 Rising. When Martin was rediscovered by the Welsh naturalist and traveller Thomas Pennant, it was via his nature writings. Pennant was attempting to write a pan-British wildlife study. The Hebrides represented a blank part of Pennant's map. Martin was not an ideal informant. Pennant had to travel to the Highlands himself to fill in the gaps. Um, then again, there are the economic projects, above all the fishery development schemes undertaken during the second half of the 1690s, especially John Adair's survey in the West Coast.
Anthony C. Martin was not only involved in the Jared's expedition, but was certainly sponsored by George Mackenzie, Viscount Tarbot, heavily involved in fishing projects at this time. Martin himself was very much an entrepreneur, creating and developing new sorts of financial and intellectual transactions, making useful and profitable knowledge out of relatively, out of relatively commonplace objects and facts locally. Finally, badly neglected in Highland historiography, there are the church missions, both Protestant and Catholic. The process of surveying, imagining, even discovering the Highlands, which was taking place, was not just a matter for geographers, metropolitan virtuosi, and economic projectors. The clergy was heavily involved, and accounts of their pastoral visitations around the Highlands can't be ignored. During the decades that Martin wrote his books, the Scottish Highlands became a crucial mission field for both sides. Many letters and reports in the church archives are complementary, though on a much smaller scale, to Martin's writings. So, Martin Martin is an archetypal example of its times of a Scot on the make, a newish breed in these islands perhaps, a British Highlander. The many twists and turns of his career, such as it was, took him across Scotland, England and the continent. At a time of increasing social, economic, political, military and indeed religious flux, there were many Scots involved in projects, schemes and campaigns which led them far beyond their native country. In his time, of course, Martin was hardly a luminary. Rather, he was in the very fringe of the Republic of Letters, indeed something of a curiosity himself. For us today, however, his literary output, the knowledge he gathered, preserved, organised and disseminated, make Martin Martin one of the most conspicuous Scots of the entire early modern era. In addition to his native wit, Martin's curiosity, energy and superlative networking skills gave him the opportunity to secure the long-term patronage, both private and official, which allowed his manuscript writings to make that leap into print, something quite unprecedented for an islander of his times. These various writings would play a crucial part in the creation of the modern image of the Scottish Gael and thus, to some extent, of both the Scot and the Celt. But that's another lecture. Thanks very much.